Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We're just thankful for the wonders of your grace, thankful for the privilege that's ours to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us, filtering out all of the foolishness and the error, all of the ignorance, but just sealing to our hearts truth. Filter it and arrange it so that the truth may grip our hearts. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com and we are beginning in our study through Jude. Every day I pray that the Lord would not let me teach error. I'd much prefer to be struck dead than to teach error. And as I pray that, I think there's at least 10,000 ministers and Bible teachers around the world or, or more praying the same prayer. And most of them would disagree with what I teach. So I'm thrilled that the Holy Spirit has been given by the Lord to lead you into truth, not me. To be a follower of me or, or any other Bible teacher is a big mistake. To spend time in this book, led of the Holy Spirit, is an amazing experience. The greatest privilege the Lord gave you is to feast upon His Word. So we begin in this video a new series of studies, a study through the epistle uh, of Jude or the book of Jude. And once again, I remind you, as I have through all of the other series of verse-by-verse -verse studies, that the author is the Holy Spirit. Almost anything that you read on Jude, there's a lot of time spent on the person of Jude. And we have all kinds of articles, all kinds of blogs, uh, websites, trying to figure out what Jude was doing. The author is the Holy Spirit. If there's some similarity between some of the verses in Peter and some in Jude, don't be surprised. It was, it was written by the same author. The Holy Spirit often quotes himself. We see that when we read a quote in the New Testament that's taken from the Old Testament. So as we begin this study, bear in mind it's the Holy Spirit who is sending this message to us, His people. It is not some historical document that has no purpose other than for the times in which it was written. It is the Word of the Sovereign God. In this case, God used Jude. His name is Judas, and we call him Jude. God used Jude to write down these 25, I believe, verses in, in, next, in the next to the last book of the Bible. And I'm not going to spend any time trying to picture for you uh, at some Jude sitting down and reading Peter and saying, well, I think I can do better than Peter. So I'm going to kind of elaborate on what Peter said. No, I don't think that that's the case at all. The Holy Spirit is now using Jude late in life. We're not, we're not exactly sure when it was written, but it's one of the later books of the New Testament. And so God the Holy Spirit says, this is the message I want, and I will use Jude. Jude, the bond slave of Jesus Christ. Bound to Christ. Jude can do nothing else. He's a brother of our Lord, a half-brother. He had the same mother as Christ. Most of you know that. So now you would, uh, you would think that it would be a good opportunity here for Jude. This kind of reminds me of our study through John, John the Baptist. You'd think that, you know, Jude would consider this the perfect time to say, well, man, I was, I was in at the beginning. I mean, Jesus was my brother. Therefore, as we, as we saw in John, Jude chooses not to exalt himself. 
as far as we know, Jude didn't recognize that he was one of God's chosen in his early childhood. He came to that understanding when the Holy Spirit led him to that understanding. And here the Holy Spirit has him say he's the bond slave of Jesus Christ. The King James Version says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And folks, we could spend a lot of uh, time wondering what that childhood must have been like. I know there's a lot of people that are just fascinated with, you know, the ideas that, you know, of them running around playing together and Jesus performing miracles, you know, and stuff. I'm not interested in that. There's been all kinds of books written about Christ's childhood. And, and in fact, some people have spent their lives trying to, to uncover, unearth the, the early childhood of Christ. There's a verse of Scripture that intrigues me. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. Yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. 2 Corinthians 5.16 He's God of very God, but he's also man of, of very man. I don't know what it was like for Jude and Jesus to live together, to play together. And James, of course, was also a brother. How many children there were, we're not sure, but we do know that Mary had other children, contrary to the teachings of, of many today. I don't think it's worth our time in the light of God's Word to try to decide what their childhood was like. If God wanted us to know that, He would have told us. So for me to spend much time on that is just to, to, to it would be to entertain you. For me to spend any, any time really on that, would, would, to me, I would I just consider that, I would consider that a waste of time. The Holy Spirit says, here is one in the very family and household of Jesus Christ who considers himself Christ's bond slave. Doulos is the word, the Greek word means someone who belongs to another, a bond slave. So what is a bond slave? Well, it's, it's without any ownership rights of their own. Doulos is used in Scripture with the highest dignity in the New Testament. And so two verses come to mind. One is, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6.20 And you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, and, and the Holy Spirit now writes to us, to them that are sanctified. It's a perfect passive. The King James says sanctified. The original text says loved. So your Bible, your, I don't know what translation you're using, but your Bible either says to them that are loved or to them that are sanctified. The original text also says, Jesus Christ having been kept called. The words being in that order of emphasis. If you look at the original text, the, the arrangement of the words is in the original text is Jesus Christ having been kept called. Bond servants loved, kept and called. I read it as those having been loved, but if you choose to read it sanctified, that's that's up to you. We we know that God set you apart. We we are, we know that. That's not what the text here is saying, but we know that. God loved you and he did it perfectly. The perfect tense here says that we are looking at the present reality of something that was completely done in past time. The text is absolutely crystal clear. 
You were loved and set apart for God before He created the heavens and the earth. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world was laid. And you are, as Jude said, says He was, you and I are also bond slaves of Jesus Christ. He bought us with a price that we cannot fully fathom. We know that to be His blood. Can you imagine what it means that God has set you apart for Himself? If we spend our time preaching on how the central aspects of your life should be conducted, we do by that much diminish the fabulous truth of what God has done for you in Christ. What I'm trying to say is, is that cleaning someone up perfectly in the, in the flesh gains no favor, no merit with God. If, if the minister's desire is that people live faithfully for the Lord, it'd be much more profitable to present what Jesus Christ has done for them and how much He loves them. How much you have been loved and set apart for Him. And that, folks, that will condition how you conduct your life. Now, you know, people think that I'm just all about, you know, well, you just live however you want. Folks, we should not, of course, be conducting ourselves in ways that God hates. And we wouldn't want to do that because we love Him, because He loves us, and because we love Him. Not because we're afraid of Him, not because we're threatened with hell. God is in no way trying to scare you into heaven. God doesn't pull any punches. What His Word says is, you have come behind in no spiritual gift. He set you apart for Him. So we hear the Holy Spirit say, I believe these are the words of God Almighty, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Faithful is He that calleth you, who also will do it. So He set you apart for, for Himself. He's loved you from before time began. You are guarded in Jesus Christ. The word there, tereo, kept. Same word found in 1 John. If we keep His commandments which as I've pointed out before, is a first-class condition. If we keep His commandments, and we will. It's an if followed by a verb in the, in, in, in the indicative mood. Since we keep His commandments. That is, we guard His commandments. Okay? It's a first-class condition. If we keep His commandments, and we will. Because the if is followed by an indicative mood of certainty in the Greek grammar. Same word. Christ keeps us. He guards us. He guards our lives. He keeps our lives as a jailer guards a prisoner. You ain't going anywhere. You're a bond slave of Christ. You're not going anywhere but to heaven because He bought you with a price. You belong to Jesus Christ having always been loved. That's what the grammar says. This is how the Holy Spirit introduces His people to the book of Jude. The Holy Spirit says, what I'm summing up here is that Christ loves, calls, and preserves His people. The Greek says, to those in God the Father, having been loved, and in Jesus Christ, having been kept called. And multitudes of Christians question God loves, preserves, and calls them. All three. If you believe what God is saying here, that you are absolutely secure, that is a position contrary to much of Christianity today. God says you are perfectly guarded. In fact, in past tense, you are preserved in Jesus Christ. 
And some of you are, are familiar, I'm sure, with the acronym TULIP. The P in TULIP stands for the perseverance of the saints, which I think is a mistake. I think the P ought to be the preservation of the saints. It isn't that you persevere. God preserves. Not a one of us, not, not you, not me, no saint can lay any personal claim in persevering. I'm sure that's not what the, what, the, what the reformers meant, although that's what that acronym came out to mean. You have been preserved in Jesus Christ. It's the only place you could be. He died in your place. If He died in your place, how could you die? If He died to pay the penalty for your sin, how could you pay any penalty for your sin? So your sins are forgiven. They're washed away. It isn't just the sins that you committed at the time that you came to understand it. But the sin question is settled for you. You've been set apart by God. You are preserved, guarded in Jesus Christ because He paid it all. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Romans 8.33 who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We're called. We're called. I believe he does that through his word. No man can come unto me except my Father which is in heaven drag him. That's why I said unto you that no man can come unto me except that it were given him of the Father. We are called ones. God has called us to Himself out of the world system. That religious system that claims to present a proper worship of God. That's the system out of which or from which we've been called. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, and no shepherd in his right mind would do that but our shepherd, but our God. He could do that. He did do that because you've been set apart, guarded in Christ, and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Amazing beginning of this, of this short little book. I think that the truths of verse 1 are magnificent. That's our position in Christ. The Holy Spirit through Jude is going to deal with problems that exist in the fellowship. That's what we're going to be seeing as we go through this. And so he begins placing us in a position of confidence. God set us apart. God called us. God loves us. God guards us. And He wants us to understand that mercy, peace, and love are multiplied. Amazing start to this, to this study through Jude. He wants us to know this right up front before we get into what's going on in the, in the rest of the epistle. These are the things that God gave. Okay? Mercy, peace, Love be multiplied. These are the things He gave. Not judgment, not hate, not doubt, worry, uncertainty. Mercy, peace, and love multiplied. Now the problem in the Christian church, it's been there all the time. I think it's wrong for Bible teachers to say it's worse today than it ever was. I don't, I don't know how we measure that, you know, since we haven't been there in the days of Jude or the days of Peter. For there are certain men crept in unawares. We'll, we'll get to that, the Lord willing, in the next video. And it occurs in every fellowship. I think from the beginning of the Christian church, there have been people who have said, we can't, we can't put up with this. You know, we're, we're going to be solid. We're going to be committed to only the truth, and they all start that way. 
They all start that way. But Satan is, uh, Satan is an energetic enemy. What I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to see is that there's an element that always creeps into the church that is not of the Holy Spirit. I, I should say elements, plural. You know, there's entertainment. That's one thing, uh, you know, which is free, you know, if you don't, ha you don't have anything else to do and, and you don't have to put anything in the offering plate. A lot of activity, a lot of fun, and then a, a little sermonette, you know, and we call that church. And, and the sermon, uh, mostly on what you must do to get God to do something, and we call that church. So we're starting out in this epistle with the great comfort, the great assurance that we have from God where we should be separate from what we're going to see revealed in this book. Beloved, verse 3. Beloved. That's an adjective in the Greek. That's what is God's favorite adjective adjective of you loved? Not hated, not judged, but loved. And that's, you know, because we're all so so lovable, right? I don't believe that God loves you, you know, because of anything in you. I believe He loves you because you belong to Him. He loves us, folks, because we are His. You're His offspring. You were born not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the will of God. He loves you because you are a member of His family. He's your Father. He told the children of Israel, I don't love you because you're great. When I gave, when I gave all diligence, the word is haste, to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The word common is an interesting Greek word, koinos referring to what is what is the word folks koinos refers to what is defiled it's something that's stripped of of all of its specialness it it becomes treated as ordinary it it describes the result of a person reducing what god calls special or holy set apart to what is mundane. It, you're stripping it of its sacredness. Defiled. Because it's treated as common. It's always used negatively for what is profaned, except here where it refers to the gift of salvation shared or held in common by all true believers. It typically refers to spiritual desecration. That, that, that happens when a person treats what is sacred or set apart to God as ordinary, not special. So how does a Jew understand how would a Jew how would a Jew have understood this word koinos, common? How would it how would the Jews readers have understood this? I'm not known for my illustrations, but let me just say if a Jew had a a special sanctified cup that he set apart for special occasions, and we all took it and we drank out of it, he would think that we defiled it. He'd think that we profaned it. We treated it as ordinary. We stripped it of its, of its specialness. The cup became mundane. The cup became koinos. The cup became common. Okay? Biblical Greek is called Koine Greek, meaning the ordinary, lang common, everyday language of, of, that of that time period. The, the common salvation of us, says the Greek. 
I believe that the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here is that I don't have some special salvation of my own, and you don't have some special salvation of your own. It is a common shared salvation. The word salvation is soteria, soterios, and we have to decide what the ordinary or common salvation is. I happen to think that the common salvation is just what the word means, deliverance, not redemption. I've discussed this in, a num in numerous videos, the difference between redemption and salvation, such as we are redeemed to be saved. We're not saved to be saved. We're redeemed to be saved. The word saved means delivered. Okay? I mean, the Holy Spirit, folks, here has, has already plainly made it clear that we are redeemed. Okay? All right? So there is a, del a deliverance that is common to us all. And it's that faith associated with that deliverance that we are to earnestly contend for. And what brings comes or what comes to my mind concerning this is what Paul taught concerning this all important matter, and that is that the right he talked about the righteousness that is based on faith. That's how we're delivered. That's how redeemed people are delivered. Redeemed people are delivered through, through the, the understanding of a righteousness that is based on faith. To be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is out of law, said Paul. Okay? I believe that's what has crept in unaware here. That's what I believe. I don't believe it's entertainment or potluck suppers or anything else that has crept in unawares. I think it's law. Be found in Him not having my own righteousness which is out of law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the out of God righteousness on the basis of faith. There's none righteous but God. He's imputed righteousness to you, but there is none righteous. No, not one. All righteousnesses of the Lord. If you go about, if we go about seeking a righteousness of our own, we fail to understand that all righteousnesses of the Lord, and it comes on the basis of faith. Faith. It comes through faith. We believe God, and it's reckoned unto us as righteousness. So, that's how I'm seeing this. It's, it is exactly this that results in deliverance. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And you can talk to a million Christians, folks, I would, I, would, I would probably guess you could talk to a million Christians and 999,000 would probably say that that means redeemed. It doesn't. One cannot believe unless they are redeemed. I challenge you, I've sent this challenge out before, I challenge you to find any verse of Scripture where redemption, reconciliation, or justification were, were that there's any synergism in it. You are justified by the obedience of Christ. You are reconciled by His death on the cross. You are redeemed because He died in your place. And because of all that, you are able to believe. And as a result of that belief, you are saved. You are delivered.
Acts chapter 16 doesn't mention the, the redemption of Paul's jailer, but the belief of a jailer who was redeemed. Redemption, reconciliation, justification. You had nothing to do with any of those three. It was solely the work of God apart from anything that you did. And yet somehow the word saved becomes this, this kind of this bucket into which we, we can put all of these words. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be redeemed. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be reconciled. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be justified. No. Delivered. Saved. Common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you, and that word exhort is our word for comfort, to comfort you or to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So there's my kind of a working into this study of Jude. Uh, I believe we're going to be amazed at what we see as we go through this. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.